testing ring circuits is easy and many electricians are more than proficient at testing them. For some though, the difficulty comes with understanding where the numbers come from, why the test results are what they are, and just how do we detect a spur. Can the test results really tell us which socket is a spur and why? A typical comment might be, I understand how to carry out an R1 plus RN test and an R1 plus R2 test on a ring circuit. But what I don't understand is, why is the test resistance for R1 plus R2 always a lot lower than when the circuit is tested end to end? And why is the resistance of the spur always higher? So, in this video, as a reminder, we will cover how to set up and carry out the tests. And then, we will look at what is actually happening in the circuit so that you more fully understand where the numbers come from. We will use the most basic ring circuit in these examples and keep things nice and simple. There are three sockets on this circuit and four lengths of conductor. This is most often twin and earth and it is the conductors that we are testing. Always remember safe isolation and always make sure that you are working safely. Remove the conductors from the MCB, from the neutral bar and from the earth bar. Separate them out and mark the two outer sheaths as A and B as shown. If the conductors are singles, you need to identify which ends go together. It does matter. We shall begin with the end to end tests. These are low ohms resistance tests. And because of the low values involved, accuracy of recording these numbers is important. For many of you, this will act as a quick refresher on the testing method. The first step is to prove the continuity of each copper conductor, and we can easily do this at the consumer unit. Using the low ohms continuity range on your meter, test between the two line conductors. This will give us little r1, and we use the little r to make an important distinction between the end-to-end -end readings and the ring readings. Little r1 is the end-to-end -end resistance of the line conductor. Little r1 is not the same as big r1. Record the results of the test in your notebook, which in this case is 0 0.8 ohms. We need these numbers later. Now carry out the same test on the two neutral ends to find the value of little rn. Make a note of the result, and it should be almost the same as the previous test on the line conductor, since it's the same size conductor and it goes to the same places. In this example, we've recorded 0 0.8 ohms again. And lastly, for this part, test the earth or CPC end to end. This is called little r2. If you are using twin and earth, you should find that this reading is a little more than one and a half times the neutral or line reading. This is because the earth has a smaller cross-sectional area. And we've recorded 1.32 ohms for this example. The next stage is to cross-connect opposite pairs of conductors. This will give us the effective resistance seen by the electricity and by any fault current. The first step, cross-connect the line conductor of A to the neutral conductor of B. This can be by crocodile clips, wagos, terminal blocks, it doesn't matter as long as it's a good connection. Then cross-connect the neutral of A to the line of B and make sure that you've connected opposites and not the same. Now we are ready to test and just where we test sometimes causes confusion. We test at the sockets now. We do not test at the consumer unit where we've just made our crossover. Most electricians will use a socket test adapter for the next tests. They make testing quick and easy and most meter leads will simply plug into them. Using one of these means that the socket does not need dismantling. Time to start the next test then. We are now going to find R1 plus Rn. Notice that this is big R1 and big Rn. This signifies that we are testing the effective resistance of the ring. 
We carry out a low ohms resistance test at each socket using the socket test adapter. Start by testing between line and neutral at every socket. The effective resistance of the ring at the first socket is 0 0.4 ohms. Move on to the next socket and we have 0 0.4 ohms again, which is what we would expect. And on to the last socket, 0 0.4 ohms. All the test results should be about the same. If you have results that vary quite a bit, check that your crossover connections are in fact correct. But why is it 0 0.4 ohms when the end-to-end -end tests are 0 0.8 ohms? Each single cable between each socket has a resistance depending on size and length. We can show the conductor resistance using the resistor symbol, and in this case, each length is 0 0.2 ohms. We can now show all the conductors like this. And when we test between line and neutral at socket number 2, we have a reading of 0 0.4 ohms. This is the effective resistance of the ring. The test meter sees two chains of resistors that are in parallel with each other, four resistors in each chain. In this example, all the conductors have the same value, just to make the calculation easier to follow. R1 plus Rn can be found by several methods, and we will use just two methods here. The IET method is using little r1 plus little rn divided by 4. Remember that little r1 and little rn are the end-to-end -end resistances, and in this video are both 0.8 ohms. This gives us a result of 0 0.4 ohms, which is what we have. Or, we can use the parallel resistance formula, where we use the end-to-end -end resistances again. First, multiply 0 0.8 ohms by 0 0.8 ohms, and then add 0 0.8 to 0 0.8, and finally, divide the top row by the bottom row. Our answer, not surprisingly, is 0 0.4 ohms again. But how do we find a spur? What happens to the readings at a spur? Let's add a spur to socket number 2. For easier calculations, let's say that the conductor length is the same as all the others. The line to the spur is 0 0.2 ohms, and the neutral to the spur is also 0 0.2 ohms. Now test it. What resistance reading do we get at socket number 4? All of a sudden, the resistance reading for R1 plus Rn is 0 0.8 ohms. This is the giveaway reading for spurs. The resistance reading suddenly jumps up, much higher than all the other sockets on the crossover test. But why 0 0.8 ohms? Where has that come from? And the clue is in the drawing at the bottom of this page. Little r1 plus little rn only works for the ring part of the circuit the spur must be added on. We have the ring part, the same as before, at 0 0.4 ohms, plus 0 0.2 for the spur neutral conductor, and 0 0.2 ohms for the spur line conductor. Since neither of these parts are part of the ring, they are extra to the ring. So, in the drawing below, we have 0 0.2 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2, which is 0 0.8 ohms. To find R1 plus R2, the effective resistance of the line at Earth, we follow a similar method. And it is R1 plus R2 that is recorded on the test certificates. R1 plus R2 is the effective resistance of all the resistances or cables in the line and Earth path. In this example, we have said that each line cable between the sockets is 0 0.2 ohms and each earth or CPC cable between them is 0 0.33 ohms. The earth conductor is thinner than the line or neutral, so the resistance is 1.67 times greater. 0 0.2 ohms times 1.67 is about 0 0.33 ohms, and this is what we shall use for this demonstration. We can test the ring using exactly the same methods as before, except that now we have crossed over the line and earth conductors 
at the consumer unit. Now, because the Earths are a higher resistance, we have a higher reading for the ring. R1 plus R2 is now 0 0.53 ohms. We've shown the test being made at socket number 2, and it will make no difference at all to socket 2 if there is a spur attached or not. It will always be 0 0.53 ohms. Big R1 plus Big R2, the effective resistance of the line and earth on the ring, is what an earth fault will see. It can be found in a similar fashion to R1 plus Rn from earlier. It is the end-to-end -end resistances of the line and earth divided by 4. We can say that little r1 plus little r2 divided by 4 is 0 0.53. Or we can use the parallel formula, sometimes called the MAD formula, M-A-D, for multiply, add, divide. Multiply the top line, r1, by r2. Add the bottom line, r1, added to r2. And then divide the top row by the bottom, to get our answer 0 0.53 ohms again. And what will the spur reading at socket 4 look like this time, now that we are testing between line and earth? R1 plus R2 for the spur is 1.06 ohms. It is made up of the effective resistance of the ring, which is 0 0.53 ohms, plus 0 0.33 for the earth conductor to the spur, and 0 0.2 ohms for the line conductor to the spur. 0 0.53 plus 0 0.33 plus 0 0.2 is 1.06 ohms. Again, the spur has a much higher resistance than the rest of the ring and can be easily identified. This is the resistance that we would record for R1 plus R2 on the certificate. A quick recap then. Little r1 is the end-to-end -end resistance of the line conductor. Little rn is the end-to-end -end resistance of the neutral conductor. And little r2 is the end-to-end -end resistance of the earth conductor. Big r1 plus big rn is found by adding together little r1 and little rn and then dividing by 4. This is the effective resistance of the line and neutral conductors in the ring. Big R1 plus Big R2 is found by adding together little r1 and little r2 and dividing by 4. And this will give the effective resistance of the line and earth, or CPC, in the ring. We write the highest R1 plus R2 figure on the test certificate. If the highest figure includes a spur, then we write that figure on the certificate. We are always looking for the worst case scenario. What is the highest resistance? If the worst case passes, then everything else will pass. Each socket on the ring will give a resistance reading of almost the same ohms as every other socket that is on the same ring. But a spur will always show a higher resistance than the ring on its own because there are additional conductors to the spur. And there we have it. We hope you've enjoyed this video and perhaps added a little more knowledge into your mental toolbox. As with all testing techniques, practice, practice and more practice is the key to being good at it. Thank you for watching, it's very much appreciated and we hope you found this video useful. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video and you'll find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel. Don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.